Judge Tom Colicchio. What do you make of today's foodie culture? Uh, I think it's become a little uh, f fetishized. Um, you know, I always say that what we do in a restaurant, you know, nobody dies on the operating table. It's just food. Let's take it easy. Let's go enjoy ourselves. I think what food really does is bring people around the table. You want to abolish tipping? Well, I, I, in my restaurants anyway, and we're working on it. I, I just don't see why uh, professionals, waiters who are working in, in, in great restaurants, why they want to be uh, subject to someone's whim when it comes to paying them. You scored as saying calories are cheap, nutrition is expensive. That's right. We have a lot of calories in this country, which will lead to obesity. People will overeat. Nutritious calories are expensive. We're, we're subsidizing things that are making uh, our country sick. Do you expect this to be discussed? I, I think they will be discussed by, by uh, Secretary Clinton. I, I don't know if, uh, if, if Mr. Trump is going to address any of these issues. Plus, and I said, well, after this night, do you think you'd interview me now? It's, <laughs> you were joking around, so you weren't serious. And you said, uh, maybe if you jumped off the building and survived, I'll interview you. <laughs> and then you went on to present. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. We're in New York City with Tom Colicchio, six-time James Beard award-winning chef and restaurateur, best-selling author, and of course, the longtime head judge on the award-winning Bravo series Top Chef. That's now going into its 14th season. He's also founder of Food Policy Action. That's a nonprofit that advocates for food and agriculture reform. Great pleasure to welcome him to Larry King Now here in New York. Thank hey, you. Larry, thank you. I understand we met at a James. We, we, we me. did. We did. This is. It was a funny moment. Um, this is, oh, God, it had to be about 14 years ago. Do you remember when you, you presented it? I spoke yeah. at the you James pre You presented Beard. right. You presented an award. And the so James Beard Awards. We were backstage together right before either you were going on or I was going on. I won, I won two awards that, that night. It was, it was a good night for me. And I was going on to present. And I was, I was next to you, and we were sharing this moment. And I said, well, after this night, do you think you'd interview me now? And you, you were joking around. So you weren't serious. And you said, uh, maybe if you jumped off the building and survived, I'll interview you. <laughs> and then you went on to present. So here we are. <laughs> You're one of the most successful chefs what was your big break? Well, oh, how yeah, did, yeah. How did you become collective? Yeah, I started working in, 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 well, in a kitchen, a small snack bar at a, a swim club that my parents belonged to when oh, I was yeah. 13 or 14 in Clark, New Jersey. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, I was a short order cook. And that, the guy who was running it hired me to scoop ice cream and, and work the cash register. And within a week, I was cooking. And it was it's still to this day the best job I ever had. Um, I was getting paid a good amount of money under the table. And I was working in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. And that was it. And it was great. I had no responsibility except for making sure the food was cooked. What do you love about cooking? You know, a simple fact that you actually can, can, can take some ingredients, put them together a certain way, serve them to someone and make them happy. That's it. Um, it's, it's a joy that you get. I think I learned that from my mother. My mother was a, the sort of Italian-American uh, Italian -American mom who didn't sit down until we were all served and taken care of. And that was just her way of showing love. And so, Did you have a big break in your career? Yeah, so, so when I was um, uh, right out of high school, I started working in restaurants. And I had planned on um, going to culinary school and um, kind of bounced around for a, a few jobs. And then my first job in New York City was at the Quilted Giraffe. And Barry Wine, who was the chef there, after four months, gave me the sous chef position. And at that point, I decided I wasn't going to culinary school. I'm at the four, uh, one of the best restaurants in the world. It's a four-star um, uh, New York Times restaurant in Manhattan, and I'm a sous chef. And so that was, that, to me, that was the big break. What's the biggest pressure a chef faces? Opening. Opening a restaurant, you know that you are going to be visited by any number of food critics, and you can't make a mistake. How did you come to Top Chef? Oh, God, I got a call out of the blue from a producer who said, I think you'd be great on the show. And I said, no, thank you. And they came back and they said, we really think you'd be great for this. And I said, no, again. They said, can we get someone to interview you? Fine. Then someone came with a camera, got me on camera. They asked if I would do a proper screen test. I told them, no, I'm really not interested. But if you really want, I'll send you a video that was done. Uh, there was an ABC News crew that was doing a, a following me uh, to do a, sort of the opening of Kraft. We opened so it's like 15 years ago. And... Um, uh, I said, I'll give you that tape. I had a, they called me up and they said, we want to make an offer. And I was like, fine. <laughs> so that was it. So I said, no, three. I played hard to get. And, uh, but it's been, it's been a great ride. Why has it worked? Uh, 14 seasons. 14 seasons, yeah. And, and last season, season, our ratings were, were through the roof. Um, it works because I think we have a combination of, uh, you know, the people who like reality TV, they, they, there's something for them. And people who are real foodies, who really care about food, and care about food on, on a much higher level than some of these other shows, I think they come to see, you know, how people can cook. You know, I, I, I talked to uh, Leo Shriver, who told me oh, this. Oh, great he said, guy. And uh, he said, you know, we, I love the show because you don't get to see someone often have an idea, it's in their head, and within 30 minutes, it's on a plate and served. And that process that happens so quickly. And when did chefs become in? And famous. Yeah, I think we go back. Because we were not known as a culinary country. No, we weren't. No, and I think you go back to uh, 30 years ago. Um, 
when American chefs finally started coming out from behind the stoves. And, and, but that was, that was uh, um, the, the predecessor to that was people like Paul Bocuse and the Trois Gros brothers who were part of the new Belle Cuisine mo movement in, in France. And when they started coming out from behind the stoves and people wanted to know who they, they were, they wanted to know the personalities behind the people who were, were putting food on the plate. Um, and then look at America, look at Wolfgang Puck and, Puck and Jonathan Waxman and Larry Forgione and some of the, the great American chefs who, who I think uh, really paved the way for, for, for people to come out and, and, and make this a respectable career. At home, the woman is the cook. Mm -hmm. Why is the chef usually male? Oh, well, my father cooked at home too. Um, you know, I, that's, a, that's a lengthy discussion. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with uh, um, society in general and um, what women have to do to, to, to um, have a successful career, especially you know, a career that mostly happens at night. And, and a lot of young women drop out at a certain point. And um, I think if we, if, we, if we had a better childcare system in this country, um, and uh, we had other ways to support women who, who wanted to continue. There'd be more women chefs. Yeah, I think there'd be more women chefs. I think there are, I mean, when I worked at Grand Rochie Tavern, at one point, um, at more than half the cooks in the kitchen and sous chefs were women. And that was at a time where I had um, uh, many, many chefs who'd gone on to do great things, um, who were in the kitchen, male chefs. And one by women, one by one, the, the women all dropped out. But at that point, this is going back 20 years ago, the women all had the senior positions in the kitchen, but they all left. Um, I think there's one person who's still, who's still working as a chef. You own many restaurants now, right? And you have other kinds of restaurants, little restaurants, big restaurants. Do you still cook? You know, what I do, is, and that's a good question, and, and I'll answer that. Um, the answer is yes, the short answer. But when you think about, if you go to see a piece of classical music, you go to, to see a symphony, the, usually the person who wrote the music is long gone. Uh, I mean, there are some contemporary uh, composers, but who gets top billing? The conductor. And you don't expect that conductor to jump in the pit and, stop pl and start playing. And they probably can, but it'd be pure chaos. And so that's what a chef does in the kitchen. The chef is there to write the music. We write the menus. There are dishes. Our way of producing that food in the kitchen. But at nighttime, if we're in the kitchen, we're conducting. We're, we're making sure everything comes out at the same How time. How often are you in the kitchen? Now, I'm, I'm in the kitchen um, not as frequently as I used to be, but when we open a restaurant, we're, going to, we're opening this summer um, a new restaurant called Fowler & Wells. Steakhouse? No, no, no. It'll Sounds be, um, like a steakhouse. Yeah, it does almost. But no, it's, um, you know, I think for this restaurant, um, what I want to do is go back. I, I call it New York food. But New York had much more of a French influence than, say, California, where there was much more of Italian influence in California. And so I want to go back to that time. When, so, you know, my food has changed from having more of a French influence over the, over the years to having more of an Italian influence. And so I want to go back to maybe, I'm not calling it a French restaurant, but I want to have more of so the more influence of butter, less olive oil. A lot of sauce. Sauce and, yeah, the old, old style of saucing stuff, yeah. Our guest is Tom Colicchio. Up next, Tom on America's obesity epidemic and which candidate he's looking to for agricultural reform. Stay with us. We're back with Tom Colicchio, six-time James Beard Award winner, restaurateur, the award-winning Bravo series. He's the head judge on Top Chef. Center for Disease Control just reported that obesity levels have gone up yet again. 38% of adults are obese, 17% of teenagers. Is that your fault? No, no, it's not my fault. It, I, think, I think it's our policies that are at fault there. Um, we choose to subsidize corn, wheat, soy, cotton, all the commodity crops that go into creating uh, highly processed foods. And so it's very easy to demonize someone for feeding their kids, you know, soda and chips and stuff like that. That's cheap. Well, why is it cheap? Because we're subsidizing it. We don't subsidize fruits and vegetables, or we, we do, but maybe of the $24 billion in subsidies, maybe 2 to 4% go to fruits and vegetables, the lion's share goes to, to commodity crops. And so that's really the problem. And so if we can make nutritious food inexpensive, I think more people will turn to nutritious foods. And so we have to have a policy that um, will support healthy foods, make healthy foods more affordable um, and more accessible. Are we dealing with record obesity rates? We are. And it's become really dangerous. When you look at, at uh, mission readiness, 25% um, of recruits showing up to fight in our wars are, are washing out because they're obese. If you look at the, the, the health care costs, $200 billion a year because of, of, health, of food related illnesses, whether it's obesity, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, these are all food related. And so, again, we're, we're subsidizing things that are making uh, our country sick. You quoted as saying calories are cheap, nutrition is expensive. That's right. That's exactly what I'm, what I'm saying. So, we have a lot of calories in this country which will lead to obesity. People will overeat, but those calories are cheap. Nutritious calories are expensive. The problem is it tastes good. Well, I think, I think fruits and vegetables taste good too. Uh, I, I think that um, there's a lot of reasons why people aren't cooking at home. One, there's the time that goes into it. It does take a little more time. It takes a little more time to shop for, for fruits and vegetables as opposed to going and buying just 
processed foods that you can slip into a microwave or a uh, fast food that you can eat on the run. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of reasons, but I think, um, you know, again, we, we have to, as a country, look at what we're eating, what we're feeding our children in schools and, and realize that if we take schools, for, for example, it, it have more nutritious food, more fruits and vegetables in the school system, the kids will learn at a very young age to eat better. If they're eating better at a young age, they'll last in their entire life. And so um, we have to educate children um, what good food is, why it's good. So I, my, my wife and I did a film called A Place at the Table. It was about um, a hunger uh, crisis that we have in this country. And we were in Mississippi, and there was a teacher who was diagnosed with diabetes. And she decided that she didn't want to go on medication, and she was going to eat her, her way through this. And so she decided what she started to learn, she was going to bring to the classroom. And she started teaching the kids what healthy food was about. And I think we actually need to do that as part of the curriculum, not as one teacher who has a mission. This should be part of what we teach our children in public school. We don't do a good job at that. No, we don't. We do a terrible job at it. What do you think of GMOs? Uh, you know, GMOs take up a lot of, a lot of space uh, right now in the food debate. I think actually, um, I don't think they're inherently bad, but I think that some of the traits, the way they're used to withstand glyphosate, um, leads to really uh, poor quality soil, and which leads to using more fertilizer, which leads to fertilizer runoff, which leads to dead zones in, 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 in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, there's nothing, the, the GMO debate has just become a, almost like a red herring for how bad our food policy is. Tell you a true story. When Nixon, and Nixon told me this, mm -hmm. when Nixon debated Kennedy, mm -hmm. before the debate, they both said to each other, listen, let's never discuss agriculture right. and food because we both don't know what we're talking about. And they never did. Mm -hmm. And agriculture is never discussed in but, debates. But under under Nixon, we got butts who said, "Get bigger, get out," and that led to this 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 you know farming just become a, a corporate entity. Um, but also under 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 Nixon, um, uh, he signed modernized uh, food stamps and school lunch program. Um, in fact, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so he, he maybe he didn't talk about it, but he certainly did a lot about it. About should it food. be an issue? How do you bring it up in a in a Clinton Trump debate? It should be an issue. In fact, this is what we're trying to do with food policy action. We have a, a campaign called Plate of the Nation, and we're trying to to get um, uh, the presidential candidates to, to respond to some of these issues around food, uh, around the overuse of antibiotics in, in, in the production of livestock, um, about, again, how do you make healthy food more accessible, more affordable? Um, how do you actually support small family farms? Um, how do you get more farmers to actually, that want to actually go from conventional farming into, into organic farming? How do you support them for the three years when their farms have to go through that period be, to get certified? And so there's a lot of issues out there um, that, that we should talk about. Uh, subsidies, where are they going, the amount of subsidies? Um, uh, whether or not we're going to cut food stamps or actually increase uh, the amount of money for a food stamps. Do you stamp expect program. this to be discussed? I, I think they will be discussed by, by uh, Secretary Clinton. I, I don't know if, uh, if, if Mr. Trump is going to address any of these issues. Are you going to support her? Absolutely. Up next, could tipping be going the way of smoking in restaurants? We'll discuss that and Tom's favorite food city right after the break. We're back with Tom Colicchio. What a story. Top chef. He's heading into its 14th season. He's the head judge at restaurants everywhere. You want to abolish tipping? Well, I, I, in my restaurants anyway, and we're working on it. I, I just think How does that, it work? Well, you can very easily raise prices by 20% and say, don't tip. And because right now, the tip goes to pay salaries. It goes to pay the salaries in the front of the house, the bussers, the waiters, the servers. Um, and um, they're at the whim of, of, you know, 200 people a night deciding what their pay is going to be. And so if we just raise prices, just like they do in Europe, and where it's not mandatory, you don't have to tip, and let us take care of paying our, our staff, and, uh, uh, and that's it. And, and so I think that, uh, you know, Danny Meyer, who I used to be partners with at Gramercy Tavern, um, he started it in a few restaurants, and a few other people have, and some have been more successful than others. You know, I, I, I use Uber. I love the fact that I don't have to worry about a tip when I get out of it. I just leave. Um, and I, I think that younger people are, are you know, it's they don't want to leave tips. It's supposed to stand for to ensure proper service, but it's given at the end. Well, exactly. Exactly. I say this all the time. You should if give you it at the beginning. at the beginning. Exactly. Um, but also, I, I think that, you know, the argument you have is, well, service isn't going to be good if they don't get tips. If you don't like your service, complain to the manager. Complain to the owner. Um, if you tell me you're not going back to my restaurant because of the service, I'll make sure that service is, 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 is correct. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you leave a bad gratuity, I don't know about it in my restaurant. You can leave a 5% tip. I'll never find out. Research at Cornell University suggests race and gender can be a factor in yeah. how much a guest tips. This is true. Meaning, uh, break it down for Well, me. race, um, the color of your skin, the accent, your accent, your gender are certain attributes of your gender. There's a lot of, 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 of things, that pe decisions that people make when they go in. You know, if, if you get, if you have your, your, the, the check in front of you and you're writing a gratuity in front of people and they can see you, you you're apt to leave a larger tip, um, especially if you're on a date. Um, yeah. If you can close that dude away, you'll leave a smaller tip. 
And so, um, but I, I just don't, I, I just don't see why uh, professionals, waiters who are working in, in, in great restaurants, why they want to be uh, subject to someone's whim when it comes to paying them. I think you that, stopped smoking yeah. in your, you, right now, no restaurant do you smoke, right? Danny and I at Gramercy Tavern, this was before Bloomberg's ban, we, we outlawed smoking in our restaurant. And I did it for personal reasons, and I think Danny did as well. My dad died of lung cancer at the age of 52. And uh, I was an ex-smoker. Couldn't stand the smell of it. Me too. Um, we just stopped, and you know, people thought we were crazy. We'd lose business. We actually gained business. Remember people were saying New York Bloomberg was wrong. And he was wrong, yeah. Look, he was, okay, I never noticed it. What I, what I do notice is that you know this is going back when people stopped smoking in, in restaurants and clubs and stuff. I didn't go home with my clothes smelling like cigarettes and open my closet and then reek the cigarettes. I used to smoke during the meal. I, I used to smoke during the meal. I used to smoke on planes. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, okay, we play a little game here, Tom, of if you only knew, I just throw some credit. What's your favorite song to sing in the shower? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, there... I, I'm, a, I'm a music fanatic, and so I play guitar, and, and so I, I often sing in the shower. Um, I'm not sure, though. It, it can change I, from day I do to day. Sinatra. You do Sinatra, okay. Food you're embarrassed to say you enjoy. I eat everything but okra and okra. grated mountain. I, I just don't like okra. Sorry. My um, wife hates leeks. Oh, I love leeks. My favorite. Um, but embarrassed, <laughs> no. I don't, I, don't, I don't do a lot of fast food, so I'm not embarrassed about that. But uh, How about a food you want to enjoy but don't eat? Um, I, I, I wish ice cream didn't go to my waistline because I would eat a pint every single night. It's great. It's great food. <laughs> Secret talent. I'm, I'm a pretty good fisherman. <laughs> good. You bring it to the restaurant, too. No, I don't keep a lot of it. No, I've, I've, I've been, I have a, a passion for fishing and a new passion for gardening. Gardening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you could trade places with someone for a day, who would it be? To be the president for the day, just to see. To get that briefing in the morning. Yeah. That, see, it would just scare like. the, yeah. really scare the heck out of you. Yeah. Chef you would trade places with? A chef that I would trade places with. You know, I, I think I would trade places. I, I, there's a restaurant that I want to go to, and this is going to sound strange. So there's a restaurant called Mimi's. And the chef, I believe her name is Liz Johnson. She's 25 years old. And for me to go back and be a 25-year-old chef, knowing what I know now, would be pretty cool. Was it in New York? <laughs> it's in New York, yeah. Yeah. But just to be, a, 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 you know, so I'm thinking of someone who's 25 years old, has the world in front of her. I mean, that, that would be really cool. Favorite food city in America? Well, New York is, is up there. You know, New York's up there. Chicago's up there. Charleston's really good. I just spent a month in Charleston. We were shooting there. And Charleston's really great. Um, there's so many great food San cities Francisco. now. San Francisco. San Francisco. But right now, there, LA has become a really great food city. Yeah, there's has. so many great. Miami. Um, you know, it used to be you would eat maybe three cities, um, you know, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, maybe. Now you can eat well anywhere. You go to Cleveland and eat really well. You can even eat good in London. You can eat, well, you can. You can eat very well in London. I, I, I went to, I was in Juneau, Alaska, and ate pretty well, actually. Really? Believe it or not, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you, what were you doing there? We were shooting, this is a couple years ago, we were shooting our finale there. If you weren't a chef, what would you be? Um, you know, if you asked me that question when I was uh, in high school, I wanted to be an oceanographer. I wanted to, I love the ocean. I've been fishing my whole life, and so I wanted to be a marine biologist or something. Is there um, a dish or a food that you haven't been able to do well with? Well, here's the, the irony is that I'm, a, I'm an Italian American and I've never done an Italian restaurant. And so maybe one of these days I'll wake up and actually <laughs> embrace that. You cook it at home? Italian? I cook at home, yeah. Yeah. I, I, most of what I do, especially in the summer, has a, you know, it's all olive oil based. Um, you know, if you go to Italy, especially in Northern Ireland, you're eating very simple food. You're eating, you get a piece of fish, it's roasted with some olive oil and fresh herb, that's it. And that's what Kraft was about when we first opened up. And so, in a way, I was cooking Italian, but it wasn't what people expect. It's not, you know, a, 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 you know we'd, we'd expect from an Italian restaurant. All right. You're going to the electric chair. Yeah, yeah. What this do you is, order? This is an easy one. So, growing up, every Sunday, we did uh, gravy. Now, in New Jersey, Italian-Americans called gravy. It was bread sauce. It was marinara with the addition of meatballs and sausage and brajol. And, and so that would be at my mother's, uh, my mother's gravy. Why is it always our mother's? Because it's, you know, I mean, my father made it too every now and then. But it was my, my mother's the meal that she made every Sunday. Well, I grew up Jewish. And so I like things well done. That's where I was raised. I had a chef walk out of the kitchen and wouldn't serve me a well-done steak. Do you have any things like that? No, my feeling is if you want a well-done steak, fine. Just don't complain that it's tough. <laughs> um, but I see, I actually think that, you know, order a, 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 you know, a braised short rib or something where it's cooked through and it's going to be nice and tender. Yeah. yeah. But there's something, see, most people who like their steak well done or medium well, they just have this thing with bread. They don't want to see what they think is blood. It's not blood, number one, because blood is in the veins and when you kill the animal, the blood well, all What is out. it? It's just coloring. It's, it's pigmentation and, and water. It's in the muscle, it's not through the veins. So it's, it's not, not blood. blood. Blood, when you cook blood, it'll turn My gray. mother said it was blood. No, it's not. We it's, never it's, saw blood. It's Jews not blood. don't believe in blood. But again, when you kill the animal, you drain it of all its blood. It's no, the blood runs through the veins, not the muscle. And so it's just water and pigmentation, usually from uh, myoglobin and from oxygen. So it, it gives it the red That's color. That's good to know. So what I like to do, people don't want to see that. If you take a steak and say it's about that thick, 
and you roast it or you cook it whole and then you slice it and then sear those cut pieces, you'll never see the red and it'll eat a lot more tender than if you cook the steak well done from a whole piece. So that's what I try to do. Good tip. We'll talk about Tom's Restaurant Empire, crafted hospitality in our final segment. That's next. We're back with Tom Colicchio. He's the founder of Food Policy Action, a nonprofit that advocates for food and agricultural reform. And he's the longtime head judge on Top Chef. You've won six James Beard Awards. That's like the Oscars, right? I knew James Beard. How great a chef was he? Um, well, I'll, I'll say something controversial. No, actually, he, he was a bit of a chef because he was a caterer. Um, oh, yeah? The word chef doesn't mean that you have some magical powers and you can cook better food than somebody else. It simply means boss. That's all it means. So really? if you're running a kitchen, you are the chef of that kitchen. Now, if you're cooking at home, like Julia Child, was, she was on TV and she was a, an instructor, but she wasn't a chef. She was a, a, a cooking instructor. She was a, an icon of, of food. But the word chef quite literally means boss. And so unless you're running a kitchen, you have a small restaurant empire, right? How many restaurants do you have? Well, we have eight restaurants, and we're about we're getting ready to open our ninth. Mm -hmm. In what cities? We are in. Uh, we have four in New York. We have one in Miami. We have a res two restaurants in Las Vegas and one in Los Angeles. And then we have eight witchcrafts in New York City. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Yeah, apostrophe W I C H. That's our, our sandwich uh, uh, little restaurants. Yeah. Have you ever had a restaurant go out of business? No, I haven't. Um, now, when I was at Mondrian, my first chef's job in New York, that restaurant went out of business, but I wasn't the founder of that restaurant. Um, there was another gentleman who started the restaurant. I came in after him, but so Craft far, well, actually, fish. that's not true. That's not true. I, I, I take that back. We had a restaurant. We had a craft in Dallas that the entire uh, development went bankrupt, and so that closed. And then we had another uh, restaurant in Atlanta. Same thing. The hotel went bankrupt, and we lost our lease. Um, and then uh, it, it Foxwoods, uh, the casino, they decided to turn our restaurant into a mall. <laughs> so, oh. And so we lost that restaurant. How do you but, come up with the name Kraft? Kraft, uh, because um, the style of cooking that we were doing in that restaurant is very simple cooking, and it was really about the product. And so to me, it was more about the craftsmanship of cooking, less the artistry of cooking. When you own that many restaurants, you have to have pretty good people working for we you. We do. Because the restaurant tour likes to be there. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I like to say the, the, the Yankees are great year after year because they have a good farm team, and that's what we have. We have a great farm team. Uh, young managers who are coming up, young chefs who become, you know, cooks who become sous chefs, sous chefs who become chef de cuisines, and then go on to be executive chefs. And so my feeling is if, if we're about to open a restaurant, we're pulling from everybody from, from sort of uh, our existing restaurants to give them a, a leg up. And, and you know, they're, they're going up the pay scale as well, and so we want to provide opportunities so they stay with us as opposed to moving on. What do you make of today's foodie culture? Uh, I think it's become a little uh, f fetishized. Um, you know, I always say that what we do in a restaurant, you know, nobody dies on the operating table. It's just food. Let's take it easy. Let's go enjoy ourselves. I think the idea to me, you know, what food really does is bring people around the table. And, uh, you know, friends, our family, our you know, business associates, whatever it is, we shouldn't lose sight of that. And we shouldn't lose sight that, that someone is cooking this food, they're putting their heart and soul into it, and they're doing it for your enjoyment, not for this, this crazed notion of, uh, of, 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 you know, taking a, you know, a dish and it's got to be the best and we have to have a list and we have to have, you know, the best hamburger in the world and the best, you know, steak in the world and the best french fries. In the world. It's just getting a little over the top. You're, but, I, you know, without that, I wouldn't have customers. So You're in a business where you have to please people every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. Great seeing you, Tom. Thanks. Good seeing you. Uh, yeah. Tom Colicchio. We were presenters we together. Were. Look out for his 14th season of Top Chef later this year and go to craftrestaurantsinc.com to learn more about Tom's restaurants or go eat in one like I will as soon as I get back to LA. As always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. See you next time. On Larry King Now, award-winning chef, restaurateur, and Top Chef judge, Tom Colicchio. What do you make of today's foodie culture? Uh, I think it's become a little uh, f fetishized. Um, you know, I always say that what we do in a restaurant, you know, nobody dies on the operating table. It's just food. Let's take it easy. Let's go enjoy ourselves. I think what food really does is bring people around the table. You want to abolish tipping? Well, I, I, in my restaurants anyway, and we're working on it. I, I just don't see why uh, professionals, waiters who are working in, in, in great restaurants, why they want to be uh, subject to someone's whim when it comes to paying them. You scored as saying calories are cheap, nutrition is expensive. That's right. We have a lot of calories in this country, which will lead to obesity. People will overeat. Nutritious calories are expensive. We're, we're subsidizing things that are making uh, our country sick. Do you expect this to be discussed? I, I think they will be discussed by, by uh, Secretary Clinton. I, I don't know if, uh, if, if Mr. Trump is going to address any of these issues. Plus, and I said, well, after this night, do you think you'd interview me now? <laughs>
You were joking around, so you weren't serious. And you said, uh, maybe if you jumped off a building and survived, I'll interview you. <laughs> and then you went on to present. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. We're in New York City with Tom Colicchio, six-time James Beard award-winning chef and restaurateur, best-selling author, and of course, the longtime head judge on the award-winning Bravo series Top Chef. That's now going into its 14th season. He's also founder of Food Policy Action. That's a nonprofit that advocates for food and agriculture reform. Great pleasure to welcome him to Larry King Now here in New York. Thank hey, you. Larry, thank you. I understand we met at a James... We, we, we me. did, we did. This is, it was a funny moment. Um, this was, oh, God, it had to be about 14 years ago. Do you remember when you, you presented I, I spoke yeah. at the you James pre You presented, Beard. right. You presented an award. And the so James Beard Awards. We were backstage together right before either you were going on or I was going on. I won, I won two awards that, that night. It was, it was a good night for me. And I was going on to present. And I was, I was next to you, and we were sharing this moment. And I said, well, after this night, do you think you'd interview me now? And <laughs> you were joking around. So you weren't serious. And you said, uh, maybe if you jumped off a building and survived, I'll interview you. <laughs> and then you went on to present. So here we are. <laughs> You're one of the most successful chefs what was your big break? Well, oh, how yeah, did, yeah. How I did you become collective? Yeah, I started working in, 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 well, in a kitchen, a small snack bar at a, a swim club that my parents belonged to when oh, I was yeah. 13 or 14 in Clark, New Jersey. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, I was a short order cook. And that, the guy who was running it hired me to scoop ice cream and, and work the cash register. And within a week, I was cooking. And it was it's still to this day the best job I ever had. Um, I was getting paid a good amount of money under the table. And I was working in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. And that was it. And it was great. I had no responsibility except for making sure the food was cooked. What do you love about cooking? You know, a simple fact that you actually can, can, can take some ingredients, put them together a certain way, serve them to someone and make them happy. That's it. Um, it's, it's a joy that you get. I think I learned that from my mother. My mother was a, the sort of Italian-American uh, Italian -American mom who didn't sit down until we were all served and taken care of. And that was just her way of showing love. And so, Did you have a big break in your career? Yeah, so, so when I was um, uh, right out of high school, I started working in restaurants. And I had planned on um, going to culinary school and um, kind of bounced around for a, a few 